Well, thanks for coming, um, and thanks for this discussion. I was, um, we were joking before that, you know, you start off a, a, a day of intensive discussions with certain ways of thinking into an issue, and of course they inevitably evolve over the day, so I was <laughs> typing up a few notes uh, in, in uh, part uh, from, uh, in response to, to what we're hearing here in Barton, because my ideas are, are somewhat in, in flux. But I think I, think, um, I, I want to start by echoing a point that Luca made at the beginning. And I think it's important, uh, at least when I think about legitimacy in, in Central Asia, at least the relationship between legitimacy and regime type, uh, which is a preoccupation of many uh, who raise questions about legitimacy in the first place. Um, and that is that endurance, the endurance of a regime is not the same thing as its durability. Just because something continues doesn't mean it was particularly durable. Um, just because something is, is, is unstable doesn't mean it will topple. Um, and I think that that's a conceptually important uh, moment because when we think through legitimacy, or when we flip this around, when we think about sort of legitimacy deficits uh, in, in certain parts of, of, of Central Asia, talk about what we mean by that, um, that doesn't necessarily spell any kind of you know, regime change, any kind of social disaster, any kind of a major precipitous, you know, uh, onset of some kind of calamity. Uh, it could, but, it, uh, but it, it takes something else. It takes a series, I would suggest, a convergence of exogenous shocks of some kind, uh, you know, perhaps of the, of the kind of, uh, you know, the economic crisis that, that we've seen recently. Certainly has been a shock to the sort of, you know, body politic and to the, uh, the economic systems um, and to the and to the, the, the right to rule claimed by these, uh, by these regimes. But even there, it's, it's striking how these regimes seem to be weathering the storm, uh, I would say, at least, at least so far. Um, there are other possible exogenous shocks that could sort of you know, converge with flagging legitimacy that could make things, things, things challenging for the regime um, in each of these contexts. Succession issues, of course, loom, loom large. I mean, those are sort of an exogenous shock that can really really be a game changer potentially. But I would say that the Turkmen example suggests it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, and if the geopolitical, the configuration of geopolitical forces that we see broadly across Eurasia doesn't change, I think you can rather expect more continuity than, than, than disjuncture when we move from one, uh, one uh, president or one ruling regime uh, to the next, even in the face of of questionable legitimacy. So I think, for me anyway, it's important to think into the question of legitimacy by first uh, calibrating its importance. Um, it's important, but it's not, it's not the only thing that, that matters when we think, in, when we think about um, political, political change. Um, the second thing I would say is, um, somewhere in the, in the promotional materials, uh, there's this great phrase that, that each of the Central Asian regimes has sophisticated communication sophisticated communication machines. And, 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 and I know what we mean by that. <laughs> and I think it's great for the promotional material. But I don't think it has to be sophisticated. I don't think it always is terribly sophisticated. And I don't think they're machines in the sense of being well-coordinated, systematic, systematically developed um, uh, efforts to, uh, to, to, to influence the you know, popular attitudes and short legitimacy. There are elements of that, and of course you see something closer to that in, in the more closed of the, of the regimes, but even there, uh, even in the, in the Turkmenistans, or even in Kazakhstan, which has, until recently, had plenty of, of, of money to, 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 to mount such an effort, it falls fairly well short of sophisticated and, and sort of machine-like um, in, in many ways. And I would question whether any of these regimes need, uh, at least over the medium term, a high level of sophistication and a you know a high level of coherence uh, for for their uh, let's say information campaigns to be successful, and that'll be a, a thing going forward uh, in my remarks. Um, I want to. It's nice that I, I got to, to follow on Sally's uh, uh, point, our discussion of, of the public uh, sphere and the sort of built environment, because I want to. I think it's also important to to remember that these regimes do many things uh, on this legitimacy front. And some of it is, you know, what we might call propaganda, at least provisionally, uh, that sort of uh, overwhelming uh, communication of a particular uh, pro-regime uh, narrative and so on. Um, but there's a lot else that's, uh, that's done. Some of it's provide public goods in some cases. Let's not forget that. Um, some of it is to build public space and, and to sort of, um, let's say, uh, encourage certain forms of sociability over, over others. Um, 
on the information front, there are a whole series of things that regimes do, do too. Some of them are much more diffuse and long term. Um, and uh, these are the sort of reputational strategies that regimes uh, of the region are engaged in. These are things that, these are, this is why Kazakhstan, um, Kyrgyzstan, you know, why, why they hire PR firms uh, in Washington and New York and elsewhere to sort of uh, to shore up a reputation uh, as a certain kind of international actor. Um, these are the kinds of narratives about uh, the um, uh, about the nation and its origins, um, and uh, propagated through through textbooks, hi uh, official histories, and, and and so on, Academy of Sciences, and, 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 and on and on. These are fairly diffuse sorts of efforts. I mean, they're they're very important, and these regimes have all taken them fairly seriously, uh, which is why we see a certain kind of congruence, um, you know. But they're they're diffuse, and they're and they're long term if they're going to be effective. The regime also engages in, in more medium term, um, what might be called positional strategies. And these are strategies that I, you know, we all hear about in the news to try to control the information field, or control is too strong, to manage the information field. Control is appropriate for some contexts and not, and not for others. Uh, these are the kinds of things where, you know, uh, uh, leaning on a compliant court system, you, you use libel suits to to, to, to sue um, uh, media outlets that are offering unfavorable coverage, encourage self-censorship, uh, which becomes, as we heard about this morning, sort of uh, fairly normal in the context of, of Kazakhstan and, and elsewhere throughout, throughout the region. Uh, this is putting pressure on journalists, intimidating them, harassing them, um, uh, disappearing them, uh, to use that euphemism, uh, if, if need be. Again, by degree, this happens in all of the, in all of the cases. Um, the research that, I've summar that I did this morning, I'll just summarize, or that I talked about this morning, let me summarize very briefly, and this is a, a third level of the kind of information management strategies that I think these regimes use. And these are, these are what I call communicative strategies, and th these are sort of more near-term strategies that regimes use when they try to convey information about that, uh, that they think worth, worth conveying. Um, and what, I, what I did was conduct a, a, conducted a survey Happy to talk about it if anybody's interested, either during the session or, or afterwards. Um, in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, these are the places where we could do this. Um, there were 1,500 people in each, and, and these are designed to be nationally representative. I could talk about that separately. And they were they were, they, they, they embedded a series of uh, what are called survey experiments. This, this may be familiar to a few people in the room. Um, the idea was to see how specific communications on the part of the regime or on the part of other sources might affect, if at all, people's attitudes. In other words, the respondent receiving a particular message attributed to the regime or attributed to another source, how does that affect how that respondent might think um, on a given issue, whether it's religion or terrorism or the economy uh, and a whole series of other things that, that we built into the survey. Um, and the assumption here is that, is that Central Asians, they're like other people, they can be, they can be quite discerning. Right? They're not simply the passive recipients of information and then, and then they're molded perfectly by whatever the regime wants. They actually can, can be discerning. They can't necessarily act back because we know the limitations of the political environment, but nonetheless they can do what they want to often with this information. So that's what this, this was designed to, to, to tease out. So let me just sort of telegraph uh, some of the key findings that I think are interesting. First one um, is that in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, the citizens' views about the economy were really unswayable. Um, regime communications, or any kind of communication, um, designed to, to, to influence how people thought about the economy, didn't seem to have any effect. Um, and, and, and that's interesting. A little bit of an effect in Tajikistan, but really pretty small, and certainly no effect in, in, in Kazakhstan. So if we're looking for one area where, where Central Asians seem to have fairly bedrock beliefs or bedrock understandings of, of their uh, relationship between, you know, to, to the economy, to society, to, to polity, it might be uh, on this issue. Um, Central Asians are, are, are not terribly suggestible on, on that dimension. And so challenges to legitimacy, like this recent economic crisis, might, we might think would be particularly challenging, whereas in other areas it might be, it might be a little bit less. Second finding is that Central Asian publics are smart, right? Um, probably shouldn't have been this in, 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 the, in the category of the fairly trivial. We're all smart. All publics are smart. But you know, it's it's, it's worth mentioning uh, how how people reacted to this messaging. In Tajikistan, um, 
uh, respondents often discounted information that was provided by uh, the state, state agencies or official news outlets. They discounted it. In, in other words, you would expect people to, to sway their views in a particular direction given this, the content of the message, but if that message was attributed to the state, then people said, mm, it, it must be, it must be, I'll just go with my inner, with my priors, okay? Um, in Kazakhstan, it went actually a little bit further in many cases on, on some of the questions uh, that people did not only discount information that was provided by the state or attributed to the state uh, or, to, or to the regime, but people actually actively opposed it. So if the Nurotan party said, uh, you should believe this on the economy, then the respondents tended to shift in the exact opposite direction. Uh, not huge, but statistically significant and, and nonetheless quite interesting that it would go in the opposite direction. And this is actually something that the theoretical literature talks about all the time. The messenger matters. It, it matters their, their, their prior credibility. And uh, in this case, it suggests that uh, certain parts of the, of the regime have uh, lesser degrees of credibility than, than others. Um, if I have another minute, let me just uh, finish up. Uh, two, two final points. Uh, two final findings. Um, first is that uh, there were some messages that we attributed to, 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 to sources that we thought would be coded in the public imagination as not political. And the, and the idea here was that Central Asians are discerning people. If they think that there's a political message being forced on them, because it comes from the state, it's obviously political, then they might treat it uh, at arm's length. Uh, but if it's the same message comes from a different source, then it might actually have an effect. And that's in fact what we do find. Um, the same message attributed to a um, state agency compared to attributed to a, uh, a film, popular film, which doesn't exist, a fictional film, um, actually had a much greater effect when it, when it was uh, attributed to the film. Okay? So the idea is that the film is coded as not political, and therefore um, uh, people are more open to, to, to being swayed. We'll, we'll do more analysis on to figure out what exactly was going on, but it's quite suggestive. Final thing I'll say is that, you know, this is a highly artificial uh, uh, context in which we're conducting this, this work. Um, one of the things that this work can't do terribly well is deal with multiple messages, right? So, you know, this is, we're, we're trying to control for things. Um, but we did have one question which was quite interesting and worth mentioning. And that is, um, that is a, a, a context in which, you know, the OSCE regularly does election monitoring in this part of the world and regularly and fairly predictably comes up with something that, uh, that is, is, a, is a critique, is a, is a criticism of the conduct of elections because, frankly, you know, the regime deserves it because um, usually these elections fall well short of, of international standards, at least OSCE standards. Um, so we compared how people responded to um, a prompt that came from just the OSCE, the OSCE criticism of the elections, compared to how other people in the poll responded to the OSCE, uh, the OSCE's criticism, alongside the Shanghai Cooperation Organization's counter. And the counter was, there were two types. One counter was, no, they were free and fair, these elections. They met international standards, they were wonderful, we were observers, and we saw it with our own eyes, right? It was sort of a soft, counter to the OSCE's criticism. And then a third group got a much more barbed criticism of the OSCE, which basically said the OSCE is part of an anti-Western, or an anti-Central an anti Central Asian, you know, uh, Western conspiracy. Um, they are, um, they're full of it, pay no attention to what they're, they're to what they're, uh, uh, to what they're saying. And here the finding was that the, um, actually the third one had an enormous impact on how people uh, evaluate the softer approach. Uh, the softer approach, which essentially sort of floods, it sort of complicates uh, the, the, the field of information with some kind of uh, alternative, didn't have much of an impact at all. But something that dovetailed with a you know, conspiracy thinking uh, about the West uh, and that was aggressively doing so actually had a huge effect on how people answered subsequent questions. So uh, the bottom line here is that there are a lot of microscopic things that are going on when we think about legitimacy and how the, how the regime inter, uh, interacts with society. And they're hard to study, but this is a small attempt to do so. Thank you so much for the three of you. I think your presentation